Hi, and welcome to the Get Fit with Joe Dell show. I am ecstatic once again to have a spectacular guest on my show. Um, Dr. Paul Mabry has been kind enough to join me today to talk all things related to kind of a zero carb lifestyle, as well as um, we're actually going to touch a lot on what I would like to talk about is insulin resistance and diabetes, since it's, it is such an epidemic, and Dr. Mabry is quite an expert on that. So, um, Dr. Mabry is a retired family medicine doctor, a writer, and a producer of several audiobooks, which I will link to in the show notes, of course, an avid hiker, a motorcyclist, a car guy, a tennis medalist, and at 67 years of age, does it all on a zero-carb, meat-rich diet. So he's just celebrated three years of eating nothing but actually meat, eggs, cheese, and butter, and drinking nothing but water, tea, and coffee without milk or cream. Um, and so I just really wanted to talk to you today. I'm so fascinated by your lifestyle and just the choices that you've made and the things that you do. And so give me kind of a brief rundown of, on just what you're all about, Dr. Mabry. Oh, well, you know, I am very blessed. Uh, I had a military career and that uh, allowed me to retire at 62 financially comfortable and free to do what I wanted to do. So, you know, when I retired, I had to think about what I want to do. The first thing I did for the first two years was to go on the senior tennis circuit in Texas. We retired to Galveston and I uh, was playing in three or four tournaments a month and uh, actually got up to be in the 60 to 65 year old age group, got up to be number five out of 92 in, in the United States Tennis Association, USTA ratings. So I did that for a while, and then I, um, uh, I had started basically an Atkins diet. I got the new Atkins for a new you about a year before I retired, and I, I lo lost a lot of weight. I got, you know, in my military career, I'd always struggled with my weight. I w I'd gotten up as high as 300 pounds, and oh of course, uh, I had to weigh, I think, 206 pounds or less to be within military standards. They weigh you twice a year in the military. And that was always a struggle for me. They have a, uh, a fudge factor that they use. So in other words, if you don't meet the military standards, uh, then they uh, do a tape measure around your neck and a tape measure around your belly. And they, uh, they take your height measurement and then they go to a chart and they get a percent body fat. And if you can come in under 22% body fat, they let you through. And so I could, if I weighed between like usually around 223, as high as 226 pounds, depending on who was measuring me, I could meet the weight charts. Wow. And so uh, I struggled with that for my whole military career. And what I would do is uh, I would starve myself on a, a low fat diet. Okay. Low fat, high carb, which I was been told by everybody was the healthy way to go. Lots of veggies and, uh, um, uh, lots of carbs, lots of pasta, low fat pasta. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, what I would do is run 35, 40, even 50 miles a, uh, a week and, uh, and, and, you know, work out a lot in the gym and I would manage to struggle, you know, and basically starve myself on low carb, low calorie diets. Mm -hmm. And then I would manage to barely get down to 221 or something and pass the test. And then as soon as the test was over, right back up, you know, wow. so that was my, that was, my, that was my life. And I was a doctor and I, I had literally, you know, thousands of patients who came to me who couldn't lose weight. And I really never, I can't remember helping a single one of them permanently get down to what the, what they'd like to weigh and stay there. Okay. Right. If you look at calorie restricted diets and you, and Dr. Fung, has gone into this in detail in his wonderful book, The Obesity Code, mm -hmm. uh, and looked at all the controlled studies on calorie restricted diets. What you see is that uh, within a year, 97% of the people, and if you look at all the studies, have regained all the weight they lost right. often with interest right. on calorie restricted mm -hmm. diets. They just are not up. You certainly can lose weight on a calorie restricted diet. And it's much easier if you're not insulin resistant, which of course we're going to talk about insulin resistance later on. But um, 
uh, in, people, uh, people who are not insulin resistant can lose a lot of weight on, on uh, calorie restricted diets, but eventually it takes a toll. So uh, that's what happened to me. And then I noticed that I had gotten down to almost like 210 pounds on Atkins and I was eating all I wanted, but I was still heavy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. what I thought was heavy and okay. uh, I had and then I started gaining weight on the on the Atkins and I think it was because of the addictive quality of some of the foods I was eating especially things like uh, 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 wheat belly pizza mix from the wheat free market yeah <laughs> which is uh, it makes two 12 ounce pi uh, pizzas uh, yeah. 12 sorry not 12 ounce 12 inch in diameter pizzas mm -hmm. and of course just a third of a pizza is seven net carbs now I'm not a big believer in net carbs uh, I think that can get you in trouble I like the way uh, Eric Westman uh, the head of the Duke Lifestyle Medicine Clinic another family doctor who I've met and talked to uh, describes net carbs he calls uh, 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 net carbs is the over-the-counter strength of the prescription and uh, uh, Total carbs, you know, is is the doctor strength. Right. <laughs> so uh, I like to use the doctor strength. I when do I'm too. treating my my insulin resistance. Yeah. But but anyway, uh, I, I think that the true answer, the scientific answer, is probably somewhere in between net and total. You know, not not as many of the fiber carbs get converted to calories as the uh, or get can get stimulate insulin as the uh, as the total carbs. But, you know, more than the actual net value, I, I think a lot of the, that fiber does eventually uh, wind up stimulating insulin somehow. So, so that's just my own Atkins, thought, but I don't have a lot. The Atkins plan led you to go into zero carb? Like, did that just kind of yeah, Actually, you? what happened was I actually started gaining weight on the Atkins, and I'm not sure why that was, because I was really controlling the carbs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pretty well, but well, and actually I wasn't really controlling the carbs pretty well. I was eating low carb foods. Now, uh, an average avocado has 15 carbs, but I'm a big guy and I'm active and I eat a lot of food and I would say, oh, I'm eating healthy avocado and I'll eat two of them. You know, that's right. 30 carbs. And that, yeah, and then I'd say, uh, you know, oh, I'm, I'm eating this healthy low carb uh, wheat belly pizza mix thing. It's only seven net carbs. Uh, per third of a 12 ounce pizza. But if you then make uh, the entire package like I did and you wind up eating five slice, five thirds, okay, that's 35 carbs right there. Yeah. And that's yeah, just one meal because I could easily that. eat true. two 12 inch pizzas because, you know, I have, I have a big appetite. Yes. So uh, I, I think that's why I was actually gaining weight on the thing. And I, I got up around 225, 230 and I said, I got to do something. And then I read the article about uh, uh, Joe and Charlene Anderson and their yeah. family and how I guess they just had their 20 year anniversary of eating they nothing did. but yeah. uh, ribeye steaks. That's and they look exciting. awesome. Okay. They do. And They're I said, like, the boy, I sure love to look like that. Yes. So I started uh, looking into it. Yeah, they look great. And then I, I, I watched a video by uh, Barry Groves. He's a, He's an um, interesting uh, professor, and uh, he was a colleague of uh, Yudkin. Yudkin wrote the book right. in 1972 called, uh, uh, what's called, uh, it was called White, uh, is it White and Deadly? Uh, okay. Uh, but it was about sugar and all the research. He was a researcher uh, in, in cardiovascular disease, and he had all the evidence how sugar had the strongest association with yeah. causing heart disease, much stronger than fat or cholesterol. Right. And, and he of was course, right around the same uh, time. Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys, yeah. Uh, yeah <laughs> exactly. Ansel Keys basically led a, who was actually the head of the American Heart Association at the time, and uh, he uh, led a crusade to marginalize and to denigrate uh, uh, Dr. Yudkin. So, uh, but the, I'm getting off topic a little bit here to okay. talk about Barry Gross's wonderful lecture. It's called Homo Carnivorous. It's available on YouTube, easy yeah. to find. Mm -hmm. And he explains how hominids, us, the, our human ancestors, you know, back to 
you know, Homo uh, australopithecus and Homo erectus and all those people, as we evolved from apes, okay, uh, we ate more and more fat and our brains got bigger and bigger and our guts got smaller. And eventually we had to eat a high fat, which basically means an animal-based diet. And if we go back and uh, look at the, um, uh, if we look at, we've got uh, uh, ancestors that go back uh, 45,000 years that we can actually get bone marrow from. And look at that bone marrow, and we can tell from the isotopes in the bone marrow uh, that those people were almost pure carnivores. They were okay. top chain predators, like wolves. And so if you, there's a wonderful movie that, that's available. You can stream it from YouTube. It's called The Perfect Human Diet. And they actually go to Zurich, Switzerland and interview the researchers who did those isotope studies mm -hmm. and explains in detail how they can tell that all of our uh, Neolithic ancestors were pretty much pure carnivores. Okay. And then there's a lot of other evidence that we really prefer to eat meat. Uh, there are some extinction studies where, uh, for instance, uh, in, um, oh, it's uh, uh, right off of a uh, little island right off of uh, Africa. Um, uh, that, well, basically, they had a large, huge 800-pound uh, uh, sloth kite creature, uh, anteater creature, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, they found the earliest human reins they found there from about 800 BC, and by uh, 600 BC, those things were extinct. Okay. Interesting. And they, you know, of course, there's evidence that that humans had eaten the bones from from you know. So there's a lot of evidence, and there were a lot of large um, herbivores in in uh, North America also where their extinction uh, coincides with the appearance of humans. So there's a lot of evidence that we evolved to eat meat much, and as we evolved, we ate less and less plants. And so that taken with the, uh, the good experience of, of the Charlene and Joe and Charlene Anderson, uh, I got, took me into the work of uh, Viljamar, uh, Stefanson, yes. who of course was uh, one of a, my now favorite uh, Harvard-trained anthropologist, who spent, who spent, yeah, he spent, yeah, he he wrote a book called uh, "The Fat of the Land," and he actually uh, and the Stone Age lived diet too, with right? the uh, uh, coastal Inuits before they had adopted a Western-style diet, and spent almost ten years eating nothing but meat, and then came back and went, but yeah, but yeah, he, uh, yeah, he. he he, he uh, came back and uh, when he got to New York City, he was actually quite a public figure. There's, there's a Canadian biography, uh, biography of, him, of him available on YouTube, but it really, frankly, it doesn't get into the diet part at all. It just gets into his political history. Yeah, there's actually a, he was so famous that there's a, a um, Viljamar Stefansson postage stamp that was made. Wow, that's, and I didn't I think know it was that. in the forties. But anyway, getting uh, the doctors in New York City said nobody can survive on just yeah yeah nobody can survive on just meat that you're going to uh, uh, develop scurvy because mm -hmm. meat doesn't have any vitamin C in it. Vitamin C had just been discovered like 15 years before, and they were just so proud of themselves that they had discovered the cause of scurvy and they actually had the molecule, and they thought they were the greatest scientists that ever lived, yeah. and they knew now that vitamin C was the answer to everything. Just, just unfortunately, as when they discovered insulin, they thought insulin was the, the uh, answer to everything and started treating uh, type two diabetes in which the problem is that the insulin is too high by giving them more insulin. And of course that has been shown not to work. Yeah, it's, that's just so, unbelievable. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anathema to me that, that they, would, they would think that. But yeah, in any case, so, so uh, I've certainly never seen it Cure Let's anybody. talk about and, that. I'm so curious about your thoughts about what is, why do we have this pandemic of diabetes and insulin resistance? Because virtually every client that's coming to me for nutrition, I'm dealing with insulin resistance or, and or diabetes. And, you know, your website, born to eat meat.com really has a great blog article on this, but just talk to me about that. Like, what are your thoughts about this? 
Well, I think that the, uh, the evidence is clear now, and uh, certainly uh, it, uh, it's, it's well laid out in Gary Taub's wonderful new book, The Case Against Sugar, is that if you look at the United States, for instance, and he's got the statistics there, but if you look, for instance, in, at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Boston uh, Hospital, the main hospital in Boston, they have records back to 1898, at which time they were getting like three cases of adult diabetes a year. Mm -hmm. And then as, the, uh, as the, the century turned and went on, the um, amount of, uh, of diabetes just skyrocketed where they were getting, you know, you know, several hundred thousand cases a year. It's mm -hmm. basically not that many. But, uh, and if you look at the rise in the incidence of, of diabetes, it exactly parallels the increase in the use of sugar in the United States, refined mm -hmm. sugar in the United States. Yeah. And the, the, uh, Gary Taubes has similar data from other countries, from other hospitals in the United States that have records back that far. Uh, so uh, that kind of evidence, uh, along with the, uh, uh, the, really implicates sugar clearly to me. Okay, as as opposed and, to other and things. really according to your uh, there's website, a, a, you talk a about real good proposed mechanism. Fructose. If you look at the work of Robert Lustig, mm -hmm. yeah, it's fructose, and that's the that's the thing. Uh, for those of you who haven't studied a lot about uh, nutrition, uh, refined sugar is different from carbs. Okay. Mm -hmm. People who don't have insulin resistance are fine with carbs. And for the most part, uh, they, can, they can eat a hard carb diet. And the, the evidence for this is the experience of Japan, where um, in Japan, they ate a very high carbohydrate diet, at, uh, tons of rice, you know, you know, 150, 200 carbs, grams of carbohydrate was not uncommon for the Japanese, right. yet they, they had a very low rate of obesity, a very low rate of heart disease. And the secret was that until after World War II, the consumption of sugar in Japan was, refined sugar was quite low. So it's, it's actually, in my opinion, not the carbohydrate that, and, and China has a similar experience, not the carbohydrate that, that has caused the incidence of of uh, diabetes, of obesity and diabetes in the United States, but it's really the sugar. Yeah. And what happens is that the sugar, because of the fructose, you see rice doesn't have any fructose in it. Uh, spaghetti doesn't have any fructose in it. A loaf of bread has no fructose in it to speak of. Well, actually well, in the, the United States, I, 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 I lied. Uh, <laughs> all, most bread, most bread has high fructose corn syrup added to it. <laughs> to yeah. They, they add, they add um, sugar to bread as a preservative because it, 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 it increases the shelf life by uh, more than double. Okay? So almost all bread is full of sugar. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, uh, and they do it also because you know, sugar is an addictive substance. It's as addictive to some people as cocaine or heroin is. Right. And there's lots of good studies to show that too. And you can find that on my website. But um, the... Uh, it's the sugar, it's, it's the fructose in the sugar that is the poison. We're not designed to eat that much concentration of fructose. And fructose can really only be metabolized in the liver. And in the liver, it's really hard for the liver to get rid of that, those fructose calories. They tend to go into fat production. And it's hard for the liver to get that fat out of the liver. So it, in people that are susceptible now, there are probably 20 to 30% of our population who can eat all the sugar they want and they don't get fat. We all are very jealous of those people <laughs> yeah, who can do that. Yeah. And uh, they, they don't appear to get sick. But uh, I found a lot of anomalies like that in my medical practice. I, uh, I had people who were vigorous in their 80s and 90s and they had smoked all their life. They were still smoking a pack or two a day uh, they were drinking a quart a day, mm -hmm. and they appeared to be fairly healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, you you meet those. They weren't the majority, I assure you, <laughs> but uh, they were there. So you so mentioned that you had uh, on three genetic different causes on your website, like you mm -hmm. were talking about three different causes that really were, you know, pinpointing that 
that obesity pandemic, mm -hmm. what, what are, are your opinion are those three causes? I know fructose you mentioned was one. Yeah, fructose, I think, is the main cause that leads to diabetes. But I think the other thing that's causing the most health problems in the United States is stress. Yes. Okay? And stress comes in many forms. Uh, yes. it, I, we, we could spend the whole time talking about stress, but basically oh, sure. when you're stressed, whatever reason, you're not getting enough sleep, you're... Uh, you're, you're uh, uncomfortable with your interpersonal relationships, uh, you're, uh, you're not getting good, good nutrition. The, the stress causes high cartisol levels and cartisol itself causes insulin resistance. Yes, absolutely. So it worsens the situation uh, and it, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very bad thing. It causes your blood pressure to go up. Uh, it, uh, puts your body into a catabolic state. Catabolic state means it's breaking down your, your proteins. Anabolic, like you know, anabolic steroids are what the, uh, uh, are what the weightlifters use mm -hmm. and that building up muscles. Mm -hmm. So uh, the cortisol is a, is a, what we call a catabolic steroid, mm -hmm. okay, not an anabolic. The, the, an, uh, an example of an anabolic steroid would be testosterone, which we also make. So it, when you're stressed, you're actually making things that's going to, uh, it also uh, uh, weakens the immune system. So you're more likely to get sick when you're stressed. Mm -hmm. So I think that stress uh, can worsen the diabetes, worsen the obesity problem, also cause the, the uh, fat to be more likely to, to be deposited in the central area where it's bad for you. And uh, let's see, uh, the... Uh, Okay, so those are those are the main two problems that I see. Um, was there a third one that you wanted me to comment on? I, I yeah, I know you uh, mentioned on one of your blogs so, about, so anyway, about our alcohol, alcohol being one of those that you have really seen oh, go along with the fructose factor. I mean, we do live in yeah. a nation where so many people are using alcohol and possibly abusing it. And I know in my own life, mm -hmm. I lost my dad to alcoholism and I can guarantee you without tests to prove it, that he was either pre-diabetic or diabetic when he died due to all of the, mm -hmm. what I know now about nutrition, I didn't know then, but looking back and thinking about his body type and how he reacted to certain things, I'm pretty sure he was diabetic. So talk to me about that alcohol portion. And I also want to get your opinion on, you know, I know there's a lot of people watching this from a carnivorous standpoint, or maybe just a low carb or a zero carb standpoint your opinion on alcohol in general, and also as a part of a zero carb diet, or maybe not a part of a zero carb or carnivorous diet. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Uh, I, uh, what, what addictions, uh, I've worked a lot with addictions, okay? And we all know, I, I've certainly in my practice, I've got to talk to so many people, and I've met a lot of people who can smoke two or three cigarettes a day and then some days not smoke any, okay? And then I've, I've met other people who have tried to quit for, for years and then all of a sudden they, they smoked one cigarette and before they know it, they were right back to two packs a day, okay? So cigarettes are more addictive for some people than others. And I think it's the same for alcohol. I think it's the same for sugar. I, you know, we genetically somehow we're probably more susceptible to some to some addictions than others and i think there are twin studies showing that there's a genetic susceptibility to being addicted to alcohol that are, are fairly compelling so we all have to figure out what we're addictive to i know for me it's sugar i still remember my father was terribly obese and i still remember trying to ride in his work car and it would always be hard in the passenger seat because that's where he threw his candy wrappers. And there'd be four to six inches of candy wrappers on the floor because he was as, as addicted to sugar as I was. I, I, I don't even want to begin to tell you how much sweets I ate. Well, I and was, I, can, uh, I can attest uh, to that. I, because I went off dad, sweets uh, July 13th, 2014. When my dad did try to stop drinking, he would yes. make me go buy him often go to sweet. gummy bears. Like So he'd say, I'm not going to drink for a while. Just go buy me a tub of gummy bears so I can stay the course. And I thought, well, how does this work? How do gummy bears help him sustain? But I was young. I didn't understand. And now looking back, I fully understand why. 
Exactly. And if you, if you, I think the thing that would help you most to understand how addictions grab you and why in the later stages of addictions, it's so hard to break them. Uh, you, if you read the wonderful book that Dr. Robert Lustig just put out, it's called the hacking of the American mind. Okay. And what happens is that things that stimulate the pleasure center like alcohol, like sugar, like nicotine, uh, they, um, like cocaine, mm. uh, they uh, cause the release of dopamine. And these dopamine, uh, uh, the dopamine then goes to, to the pleasure center nerves, which actually re re release endorphins, which is a human form of narcotic. And that's what actually gives us the pleasure. Okay. Right. But what happens is those, the nerves that are stimulated in the pleasure center by the by by the um, uh, by the cocaine or by the nicotine or uh, by the alcohol mm. uh, release are uh, are uh, 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 sensitive to being overstimulated. Mm. So what happens is you wind up overstimulating those nerves. So what happens is. Uh, uh, those nerves that are being stimulated downregulate the receptors for stimulation that are on them. Mm -hmm. So you have to take more cocaine. You have to take mm -hmm. more alcohol yeah. to, just to get the same buzz you did the first time you take it. And that's called tolerance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now what happens is when a nerve is overstimulated, okay, it's harms the nerve. That's why it's downregulating it. And eventually those nerves can die and they can't be replaced. So what happens in people who have been long-term cocaine abusers, long-term alcohol abusers, they've actually killed off a lot of the intermediates. So it's the intermediate step between sensing you've drank alcohol and then getting the, the rush of, of narcotics, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those have died. So if they try to stop drinking at that point, they can't upregulate their receptors anymore because the nerves are dead. And so they're just really in a funk and their life is not very, their quality of life is not very good because there's no way they can get rewards unless they take narcotics directly. Yeah. Which is what winds up leading to narcotic addictions. Mm -hmm. It's actually the narcotics again. And that whole pathway and all that, that is spelled out in Dr. Lustig's book, The Hacking of the American Mind. But if you, um, to get back to your point about how alcohol damage, uh, damages your health, contributes to insulin resistance. It's interesting that, uh, that uh, ethanol, the active chemical in, in an alcoholic drink, is a breakdown product of fructose. Mm -hmm. The same pathway as, as uh, fructose is, mm -hmm. and it gets turned into fat. So uh, in the same way, you, everybody's heard of people dying of cirrhosis of the liver. Well, mm -hmm. it, cirrhosis of the liver just means a liver full of fat. Right. If you look at, a, um, F, uh, at a, uh, the liver of an alcoholic who has cirrhosis, as I have in, in the autopsy room, it looks like there's tiny little white marbles of fat all over the liver, and it's kind of shrunken and shriveled mm -hmm. and, and just full of these balls of fat. Kind of like and, it's uh, if you look at somebody shiny, who has advanced look at the liver uh, and it's liver like marbleized like a sugar. big ribeye steak basically right yeah yeah exactly yeah and uh, uh gradually over time if you eat enough sugar it does do the same thing to your liver mm -hmm. if you look at it under the microscope they look pretty much the same so um uh it's at deposited other where other places in uh uh, what we call the the uh, the viscera or the peritoneal cavity uh, on the pancreas, on the thymus, on the kidneys. Okay, in that area, this fat for some reason seems to be more toxic than other places in most people. Now there are some people who can get fat there and don't seem to have a problem, but they're again as rare as those guys who can uh, smoke two packs a day and drink a quart a day for 95 years you know, and appear to be healthy. So right. they exist. <laughs> Some people seem to be protected somehow. I, my family certainly is. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so, uh, what, what you, what you have to do is, uh, again, how much, uh, how much alcohol you can drink without developing that is, is gonna, 
depend somewhat on your genetics. Uh, it's just like with cigarette smoking, uh, only about 33% of people who, no, sorry, it's 12% it's of people who smoke are going to get uh, lung cancer and about 33 to 40% are going to get emphysema. Mm. And the other 60% aren't going to get either one. So, good? you know, it's, it's not like everybody who abuses a substance is going to pay as many consequences as people who didn't. I think there's now, a lot I of personally to think that. that. I think there's that, a lot of validity, uh, not just the, to the alcohol portion, but also to the to diets in general. Like I want, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on alcohol on a carnivorous or zero carb approach diet. But also um, to that effect, is there? Do you believe, as a doctor, is there some relative content towards some people will do really well on a zero carb diet and others might not? Like, is there a case for that at all? Well, you know, I think that that uh, uh, people really need to know themselves well. Okay, I think that there are people out there who can have a glass of wine in the evening, and that lowers their stress enough that that probably is uh, positive for their health. Okay, or have a glass of wine with their dinner, mm. or you know, one or two glasses of wine a day, and they're never gonna, you know they're not the kind of person who's going to have a weekend where they drink five bottles of wine on Saturday and six on Sunday. Right. Okay. Uh, so you need to know whether you're one of those people that can, can, you know, can stop it. I, I really have no problem with alcohol. I don't drink alcohol. I haven't had a drink in probably 10 years, mm. but uh, because I have relatives like you, I have three relatives that I can think of who died of alcoholism. Okay. Yes. Uh, and, um, I just, and I just personally don't like the way it makes me feel the next day if I drink too much alcohol. Okay. I, I like feeling sharp, mentally acute, and uh, it well, doesn't, certainly certainly doesn't do anything are. for my tennis game. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, I, I want to keep my mental, my, my goal in, in life is to try to keep my mind sharp un, until it's time for me to go. And well, uh, I, don't, yeah, I appreciate I, that about you because I, I can tell not only you have that going for you, but I'm as I'm watching you, I'm seeing how clear your skin is. So I can tell you take very good care of like your nutrition and what you're doing is definitely working for you because you, if people will look you up, you're no longer the size that you were when you were telling your story at the beginning, that you are very fit and trim now and doing a lot of active things. So, um, but going back to that question about alcoholism, so I agree. I think it does, it does a matter what our actual bodies are geared for. And we, if we would pay attention to that, we would understand that, yes, some of us can get away with alcohol and some of us cannot. Some of us can get away with a little bit and some of us can get away with none. But I think it's, it's about listening to your body too. Um, as far as though the eating goes, you know, there have been people in this carnivorous or zero carb circuit. And I know you as like on, I think your Facebook page is zero carb doc. So people can check you out there. But have yes. you seen people that have come and gone, like they've done it for a while and then they realized zero carb didn't work for me. I'm having so many other problems now. Or do you really feel as a doctor that this is an approach that would help anyone that tries it? Or are there people out there that maybe just cannot, their body just won't resonate with this? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a very viable uh, uh, way to eat and a very healthy way to eat. Okay, uh, I think there are problems with plants, mm. but um, in my study, uh, e even these uh, uh, Neolithic people that I'm talking about uh, ate some plant materials. Mm. Uh, Every society that I've ever studied, even the ones I use as examples of primarily meat eaters, like the Inuit, okay, they would uh, uh, take berries in the spring and they would uh, preserve them uh, in, uh, in seal fat, okay? Mm -hmm. And they would use that kind of like a treat or a dessert. Okay? That's right. So, you know, it's, I don't know, of, you know, and, and Stefanson talks about that in his book. I don't know of any pure meat only, uh, except for the possibly some of the, um, uh, uh, some of the Maasai warriors, uh, in a pure Maasai warrior was not supposed to eat anything but meat. Okay. Uh, the, the women 
they, they ate some plant foods, but the actual warriors were not supposed to. I think that they do now some, somewhat, but they, they still eat a very low carb, high fat diet. And if the tr at least the ones that are eating the traditional Maasai diet don't eat uh, uh, things that are high in fructose, mm -hmm. okay? Because they're eating a lot of milk, they're drinking a lot of milk, but then the milk is full of lactose, which is glucose and galactose. And our bodies break the, that, that's another disaccharide, just like sucrose, the sugar is, is glucose and fructose. Mm -hmm. The lactose in milk is glucose and galactose. Our body breaks those down and then quickly changes the galactose to glucose. Okay. So they're not getting the fructose, which is the real poison. So mm -hmm. I think that's why they get away with eating tons of milk you know, in, the, in their diet. Um, so I, I, to answer your question, uh, uh, I, I think that people can, some people can eat a plant diet. I think that there's, there can be problems, especially with wheat. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think if you eat too much fiber, that can be a problem. Okay? Right. And uh, I think that it, it can cause, cause leaky gut syndrome and, and lead to autoimmune conditions, but not in everybody, just like some people can smoke. Yes. Some people can eat a lot of fiber and not have a problem. Okay. So, so uh, the, the big benefit I see to the zero carb diet that, that I follow is it, I, I have shown inability to be temperate with, um, say, with what I'd call highly palatable carbohydrate dishes, okay. like the wheat belly pizzas mm -hmm. and the, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, and, and, uh, avocados and spaghetti squash, you know, when which you is say just highly temperate, uh, um, seven you, net you carbs. A cup. You feel like you can't I, stop when you start eating them or they just don't work with your system. I can't stop. Oh, okay. When I stop eating, yeah, it, I, I'll have two or three cups of spaghetti squash with some, uh, to, uh, with some uh, low carb tomato sauce on it. And then, you know, a couple of hours later, I'm hungry again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now if I eat something really fatty, a couple hours later, I'm not hungry. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think that the the zero carb helps me that way. But I I just wasn't able to control myself around these things that reminded me. It was almost like in my mind I was eating spaghetti, real spaghetti, you know, and I just couldn't stop. Okay? Right. Like, oh, I can have all this I want. You know? right. No, it didn't work for me. So mm -hmm. zero carb helped me in that way, and I I finally recognized that I was not able to be temperate with those things. Okay. Some people who can eat just a cup, cup and a half, and they're happy. You know, if that works for you and you're not, you don't have autoimmune problems. So that's I still think people what you bring up, that, is like uh, really these that, people mm -hmm. out there that are yeah. thinking to themselves, I am having so many issues with these different trigger foods, you know, like certain foods that I just can't stay away from. And even if they're seemingly yeah. healthy foods, what you're yeah. saying is the zero carb lifestyle may be something that will dampen yeah. that I always need to eat or I'm never full or I'm never satisfied. And do you think that that plays into like leptin because fat is so satisfying that you're really creating that leptin release that tells the brain and the body that we're full, we've got fatty fat to burn and things like that? Yeah, I think it has to do with leptin, but I think it has even more to do with uh, glucose-like protein one, GLP one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you look at the nowadays, the, the most uh, c common medicines that they're using for diabetes are G GLP one agonists, mm -hmm. either by decreasing the breakdown of GLP one or stimulating the relief. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, there are medicines like Genuvia and, and those sorts of medicines, and uh, uh, it turns out that we have something called free fatty acid receptors in the gut, both in the stomach and in the small intestines. And these sense free fatty acids. So when you eat fat, when the free fatty acid receptors are stimulated, they, they, they uh, secrete GLP-1. And GLP-1 has been shown to cause fat cells to, increase, uh, to, to secrete increased amounts of leptin. So yes. it's a, a cascade. Cool. And I've got a, I've got one of my posts on that. It's called how fat helps you lose weight. Yeah, but, you have uh, another post that the, I really uh, loved too that I wanted to with talk the about as well. And that was, um, uh, can can our mind make us sick? Um, tell me about that. Like I really loved that post. Uh, it was just such a well written post. Tell me once again. Uh, I the word that uh, the the post was about got a little garbled. Oh, I'm sorry. Can our mind make us sick? 
Oh, yeah. I would love to talk about that. You're, you're, you're hitting on one of my favorite subjects. Oh, good. Today. Thank you. Uh, uh, just give me, give me five minutes here and I'll, I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on that. Okay, I will. Okay. It turns out that, that stress, not only does it harm you by cortisol, but when you're stressed, okay, what actually causes the cortisol is that you're, uh, you have two pathways in the autonomic nervous system. There's the, uh, 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 there's the sympathetic pathway, and the sympathetic pathway is the fight or flight pathway. Okay. And that is stimulated when you're angry, when you're scared, when you're fearful, and it's also stimulated when you don't get enough sleep. Okay. It's the thing, it's, it's, it's how you dip into your reserves. Okay. So when you're dipping into your reserves, okay, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're stimulating your sympathetic nervous system and it's going to make you put out adrenaline and it's going to put out cortisol. It's going to, it's going to cause the cortisol release okay, mm -hmm. that causes the stress uh, function. Now, when you, uh, you have another pathway in the autonomic nervous system, the other pathway is called the parasympathetic and it's called the feed and breed yeah. <laughs> system. Okay. So, um, uh, when, when you, when you, when that s system is predominant, you're, uh, you're, uh, you, it, resources go to your digestive tract. It, uh, the parasympathetic controls the entire digestive tract. And in fact, it has little, um, uh, mini brains called ganglia. They're about the size of a marble or larger. And they're about every three or four inches all up and down the intestinal tract from your mouth uh, to your, uh, to the uh, rectum. Okay. Yeah. And they, if you add up the total volume of nerve cells in those ganglia, it's about a, th a third the weight of your brain. So there's a lot of nervous tissue uh, that can uh, involved in the parasympathetic nervous system. And it turns out that, uh, uh, that uh, the it, uh, it's um, it, if you overstimulate the sympathetic nervous system, it leads to high blood pressure, to cortisol release, to insulin resistance, to all those kind of things. And our stressful environment does that a lot. Now, uh, what I found is that a lot of people who go on various diets or for whatever reason they say, "I can't take dairy." As soon as I take dairy, uh, I get hives and I, I get bloated and I have terrible abdominal pains and, and so, or as soon as I eat, uh, you know, anything fatty or whatever. Well, you, the answer is whatever the food is. And I've heard all kinds of foods triggering terrible things in some people, you know, I can't eat this. I can't eat that. And what happens is for instance, with, with fatty foods, people say, I get eat fatty foods and I just feel horrible. Okay. Well, what happens is, and I think in a lot of people, is that um, they've been told since they were small children that if they ate fatty foods, they were going to get a heart attack and die. They were right. going to get fat. That's yep. what's making you, gonna, you're going to get fat if you eat fat. Right. And so they eat fat and it sets off the sympathetic nervous system. And, and, and it disrupts the parasympathetic nervous system. And our, our brains uh, uh, are capable of causing all those symptoms. Right. Uh, our brains can cause hives. Our brains can cause, uh, uh, you know, our brains can cause nausea. The, the entire process of the digestion is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you overstimulate your sympathetic nervous system with thoughts, okay, uh, then you're going to certainly lead to a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms. Absolutely. Now, the leader in the research on this, and, and there's lots of links in the, in the article on can your own uh, mind make you sick, uh, my post, uh, uh, the, uh, is, in my opinion, Richard Gavirs. Okay. And uh, he's, done a, he's at Alliant University in San Diego, and he's done a lot of work with something he calls resonant breathing. Mm. And what he did was to go around and study uh, holy men all over the world, uh, yogis and uh, seers and Sikhs and uh, uh, all these people. And he told them to, to go into a 
uh, a state of, of, of meditation where they felt at peace or whatever. And he hooked them up to all kinds of physiological measurements like blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate. Uh, and eventually, after many years, he started using something called heart rate variability. Now, heart rate variability is uh, basically a measure of, of uh, the, how from beat to beat, each heartbeat to the next heartbeat, is there, there's a difference in time. Okay, so it might be closer together now and farther apart. And the reason this is important is because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the rate of our heartbeats is also co controlled by, this, by the uh, autonomic nervous system. And so uh, uh, what happens is when we, uh, when we breathe in, our hearts tend to speed up. Okay? Okay. And when we breathe out, our hearts tend to slow down because there's not as much oxygen in the air, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in our lungs during the exhale portion. So you don't want to send as much blood by. Okay? You can conserve a little energy by, uh, by slowing down the heart, the heart rate during the, and this is called, uh, 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 um, um, this is called, uh, Sinus arrhythmia. Okay. Oh, yes. So um, the uh, people who have an increased sinus arrhythmia and uh, uh, sinus arrhythmia, when the, when, the, um, when the sympathetic nervous system is, is engaged, it says, I don't need to conserve oxygen anymore. I'm going to make the heart beat as fast as possible. Okay. So the more your sympathetic system is engaged, the lower your sinus arrhythmia is going to be. As you're get more uh, parasympathetic dominance, which is what you want. Okay, right. You want parasympathetic dominance because that's lowering your stress. Uh, then, uh, then the sinus arrhythmia increases and your heart rate variability increases. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he did some, some studies uh, to show that by doing these, these slow breathing between six, uh, between uh, uh, five and seven breaths per minute mm -hmm. that he could actually in increase the parasympathetic tone and decrease the sympathetic tone. And he then, uh, he's done, has over 40 published studies and in children with GI symptoms like uh, nausea, vomiting, constipation, uh, stomach, chronic stomach pains. Uh, he did randomized controlled trials between sham, bre sham breathing and where they just said, okay, we want you to breathe in and out and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just uh, they found the child's normal rate of breathing. They said, "Okay, I want you to breathe at your normal rate of breathing." You know, and and then doing the the um, um, uh, doing the uh, controlled breathing, and he in his studies he had uh, eighty five percent total remission rate in children that were sent sent to him for irritable bowel syndromes oh, over awesome. placebo. You know? Yeah. So awesome. it's a totally amazing stuff. And uh, not only that, but it, it's a really good for performance anxiety, like giving interviews. So for the five minutes before we went on together, I was doing uh, resonant breathing. Awesome. Uh, and I, my, my preferred thing is, is four breaths per minute. Okay, that's well, what I love that you practice and what I use you a, preach a, in a, all of the things that are on your blog. Like you practice the zero card lifestyle and now you're talking about these breathing things that you put out there for people as real, you know, real solutions to problems and you're doing them too. Yeah. I mean, you're definitely a living example of what it means to be healthy. And yeah. so to further this, like, if I was going to, because I know we're getting short on time, but if I was going to ask you, you know, with regard to this yeah, insulin resistance and diabetes and things like that, and also with regard to just creating a more healthy lifestyle without inflammation, without insulin problems, um, talk to me about some strategies that you really recommend that people could start implementing today, even if maybe going zero carb seems a little extreme for them. What are some real life strategies that people could just start to tweak in the right direction to make some changes and not become part of this pandemic? Well, thank you, Joe Dale. Uh, let me give my little two minute uh, message that I want to tell everybody. Okay? okay. What I want to tell everybody is that uh, if you're healthy and you're not insulin resistant, uh, then 
uh, just eat uh, a well-balanced diet with lots of meat in it and you're probably going to be fine, okay? And you can have a lot of carbs, you can have the occasional pizza, but just stay away from the sugar and if you can't, if you can't be moderate, stay away from the alcohol and you're, you're probably going to do fine and, and never get diabetes. But if you're insulin resistant and uh, there's uh, basically the best way to, to, to find out if you're insulin resistant or not, certainly if you're, uh, if you're, if you're overweight, you're almost certainly insulin resistant. Okay. If not, your doctor probably did a cholesterol panel on you. And if you're uh, triglycerides using the milligrams per deciliter scale uh, divided by your HDL cholesterol is greater than one, you're probably insulin resistant. Okay. And so if you are insulin resistant, then you, you're sick and you need treatment. And the treatment that's worked for me and so many other people is to limit your carbohydrates to no more than 20 carbohydrates total per day and, and zero carbs one way to do that, but there are other ways to do that. Okay. And the, um, to limit your protein to no more than 1.5 grams uh, of protein uh, per kilogram that you want to weigh per day. Mm -hmm. Very okay? good. And that's uh, the reason you need to do that is because in people who are insulin resistant, that's going to cause too much, uh, uh, insulin release and you won't be able to get the, the fat out of your fat cells to burn it if you've got too much insulin around. Yes. And the third thing that helps you get your insulin down is intermittent fasting. And I recommend um, a, uh, uh, an eight hour window or less during every day, eight hours or less when you eat all your food. Yes. And I recommend that everybody avoid like the plague counting total calories. Okay. Mm -hmm. You got to count your carbs. If you're zero carb, you don't have to count your carbs because you don't eat things with carbs in it. That's one of the beauties of zero carb. Right. But you have to count your protein. And there are ways on my, on my, my homepage that explain how to do that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, and then uh, the other thing is when you eat, eat till you're full. Okay? And if you find that you're, if you're eating till full means you're eating too many carbs and too, many, um, and too, many, too much protein, then you have to increase the fat. Okay, so you, you've got to keep the carbs and the protein under, but you also shouldn't starve yourself. You shouldn't be hungry. You shouldn't be hungry between your meals, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's the secret. The secret is high fat and uh, the, those things I said. And, and, it and with regard to, like, that's the nutritious side. And when you're mm -hmm. talking about stress and things like that, mm -hmm. what are your go-to um, plan for people who are really need to address the stress and aren't seeing how detrimental this is. Like they're just living this chronic daily stressful life. And even speaking yeah. to the fact that there's carnivorous people I know that are just so stressed. They're even stressed about, like you said, with regard to food, they stress about the food they're putting in their mouth. Is this too much? Is this too little? Should yeah. I have more? Should I have more fat? Should I have more protein? Like what, what about the stress? What's going to happen to us if we only do the nutrition side and we don't address the stress? Well, you know, uh, you'll lose weight, okay? But what I've found is that to get that last 10 or 15 pounds, you know, to get down to what people really, really want to weigh, uh, that's where the stress comes in. And I think some of the best things you can do for the stress uh, is number one, uh, learn how to breathe yoga for five years when I was a young man. And one of the things they told me was that you, uh, if you can't be out of control of your emotions if you're controlling your breathing. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're feeling angry at somebody, if you're feeling a tightness in your stomach, be sensitive to that. If you're worried about that presentation you've got to give to work today, then what you need to do is you need to, uh, to, to suppress that sympathetic um, surge that's happening in your body. Uh, so the, um, uh, fear and, and anxiety is, uh, is sensed in a part of the brain called the amygdala. Okay. It's in the center of the brain and it, it's what is the main driver of the sympathetic nervous system. It's the thing that it gets sensory input directly from your eyes and ears and your skin. And it's the thing that when you hear that, uh, stick break, when you're camping out to, that wakes you up, cause that could be a lion. Okay. Yeah. Even before you realize you've heard the stick break. Mm -hmm. uh, you're up and you're alert. Okay. So uh, it's, uh, we call it an amygdala hijack that can happen, especially, you know, if, 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 if things triggers you of a uh, remind, that's what PTSD is. Something triggers a reminder of a really scary event 
and uh, and the am the amygdala is hyperactive and and you know they they become um, panicky. So uh, so learn to watch for your amygdala hijacks and stress. And when it happens, learn how to go into a slow breathing mode. Now, uh, what Dr. Gewirth says is he practiced it daily for about six months and he learned how to do it. Okay. And that's what I do, but I now know how to, when I, when I see the, the uh, sympathetic uh, system being stimulated, I know how to go into that slow breathing process and control it and just camp it down. Yeah, so I, really good everybody learn how to breathe, get enough really sleep, people don't get enough sleep. You know, okay. Counting to yeah. three don't watch and a, inhale and then making your exhale twice as long. Like really, when you think about inhale, one, two, three, exhale, one, two, three, four, yes. five, six. That can really calm down that parasympathetic nervous system. So Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I like to use a... Uh, uh, a 30, 70, uh, percent, uh, 30 inhale, 70 exhale. Mm -hmm. But, um, all that's, I talk about that all in my blog, but what I wanted to say was if you can learn to control your breath, then get enough sleep. People don't get enough sleep. Right. People don't get enough exercise. Exercise mm -hmm. is wonderful. Okay. Um, uh, people don't get enough, uh, just being in nature. I, yeah. I go do a lot of hiking in Vitamin the mountains N. and, uh, <laughs> Just being out there in nature is, uh, is uh, will really decrease that. Yeah. You get out into our, sit in a rose garden, spend some time, smell the roses. Okay. I agree. Uh, uh, totally. There's more to life than, than work and making money. And, uh, you know, you've got, you've got to do that for, your, for yourself and for your children. But uh, uh, while you're doing it, learn, learn to, to be in touch with your, and don't let that, um, uh, don't let your sympathetic nervous system get, yanked out of control <laughs> well, and avoid those so uh, uh, avoid getting hooked just, on stuff. Oh. they're stressed by uh, by sugar alcohol nicotine you know don't use sugar alcohol and nicotine to control your stress uh use healthier techniques. right those are just band-aids and so that's my, yeah, I, that's my I totally mind. agree with what you're saying exactly. and i i wish we had more time because you've got such a wealth of knowledge but i hope that you'll come back right. on can i interview you again sometime Absolutely. Any, okay. I'm, I'm retired. Great. <laughs> well, uh, but just before I let you go, how can people find out more about you? I know your, your website is born to eat meat.com, but what are there? Yeah, my main activities right now are, yeah, you can either go to born to eat meat.com or zero carb doc doc.com okay. and eat both lead to the same place. And I'm I have a Instagram Facebook person. Are you on Instagram doc. at all? You know, I haven't gotten there yet because uh, you have to do it all on your phone. You can't right, do it right. from your computer. Right. And that's, uh, uh, that's uh, been my stumbling block. And I'm, I'm so, my, my Facebook group now is taking two to three hours a day to answer all the yeah. tags and well, that's all very the, cool of you, to you know, keep that. up with all the, I feel <laughs> it's important that I keep up with all the, all the, all the, um, all the strings, you know. Well, that's why and, I wanted uh, to have you on because I can tell from your, your blog and what you're doing online mm -hmm. is like, you have a passion for this. And I, I'm very similar. Mm -hmm. I do this, not, I don't make money doing these podcasts. I just have a passion for it. And I love like-minded people who are just out to put a good word out and help others. And I really appreciate that about you. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. I just want to, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, it makes it, I think that Helping others is one of the healthiest things you can do, frankly. Here's a stress it, reliever uh, right there, right? <laughs> if, you, if you read Dr. Lustig's book, yeah, you know, the, the Hacking of the American Mind, which I recommend everybody read, uh, he talks about what you want is not uh, uh, what you want is not happiness, which you get from drugs. It's a, a happy moment. What you want is contentment. Oh, yeah. And contentment you get from being with others, helping others, you know, having a family. Uh, you know, uh, doing what you love to do. Those yeah. are things that bring contentment and, and uh, uh, drugs and alcohol and, and other things just bring a, a few minutes of contentment and in the long term can actually damage your brain. So. Yeah. And sugar is number one among those. <laughs> well, I agree. So and thank, thank you so much, so much for, yes, I, thank you for your time. I'll be glad to come back later on. 
Yes, I would love that. That would be awesome. So I want you to have a wonderful Saturday and we will get back together soon. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like to win a free box of F-bombs? My generous sponsors of the podcast, dropanfbomb.com, have agreed to give away five boxes to my listeners and to my followers here on Instagram. So if you want to enter, here's what you're going to do. Like my page and like F-bomb's page, Fat is Smart Fuel, all one word. Then direct message me and say, I want to drop an F-bomb. Okay, that's your code to enter. So maybe you've already liked both pages. That's totally cool. Just make sure you enter by spreading the love and telling your friends, share this page on your page, and have them direct message me and say, we want to drop an F-bomb. And make sure they enter your name and theirs. And so then you have um, chances, and I will randomly draw five winners on May 5th to have a drop an F-bomb shipment drop ship right to your door. Your own favorite flavor. So drop an F-bomb in a healthy way. Get yourself your very own box today by entering. Thanks for listening.